Next day. Hello, everybody. Hope everybody's ready for this session because I am. Gary, how yes. you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Great. Hello, Hong Kong. <laughs> Hello, Hong Kong. <laughs> Now that's the spirit. Yes. Okay. Before we start, maybe maybe I'm gonna start a little bit. There's gonna be a Q&A session here, so please get ready with your questions, and then you can ask Gary straight away. But before we start, do you, if if I see a lot of your videos and all that, and you talk a lot about startups, right? And there's so many startups right here at Rice. Um, they they rise and they fall, and they yes. rise and they fall. How many times did you rise and fall all the way through your own experience? Well, as an entrepreneur, I think I rise and fall on a daily basis on a micro. Uh, on a macro, I haven't had too many falls in the companies that I've run because to be very frank, I was born in the Soviet Union, I'm an immigrant, and mm -hmm. I am not a tech entrepreneur that thinks about funding and customer acquisition and metrics that have nothing to do with running a business. Mm. The businesses that I've run have been a wine shop e-commerce business and a digital agency. Neither had funding. The first was a family business. The second, I started by getting a client. VaynerMedia is seven years old. I've grown it from zero to $125 million in revenue and we never raised the dollar. Mm. I just run a business. You know, a business. One where you make more money than you spend, right? and it's about having customers. So <laughs> I haven't had falls because I haven't put myself in the position to be a unicorn or go out of business. Mm. I've been tried and true, build actual businesses. On a micro, I make fucking mistakes daily, and I think that that is just part of the game. Um, and it's all right to make that kind of mistake and not getting back up. Yeah, I think the biggest reason I believe we're living through fake entrepreneurs and a huge influx of fake entrepreneurship is because you have to love to lose. Mm. You have to like to have the chip on your shoulder, the scarlet letter, if you're a purebred entrepreneur. I prefer, prefer to be underestimated. I would argue for all my self-promotion and me being out there, I speak, if you know my spiel, a lot more about my hard work than my smarts. I rarely talk about being smart. Like, you know, I let my actions speak to my smartness on proper investments right. or predicting where the world's going or auditing where the world is properly. Um, but I, I like losing. I like, I, I mean, I left the wine business because I won. Mm. I will leave the agency landscape eventually too. Now that Vayner's starting to become a player, it's not as fun. I right. like when people don't, you know, one of the reasons I'm so excited about getting into the Asian market with my content, with Vayner Medium, with my investing, is I'm far less of an entity in this part of the world. I'm underestimated. That's more interesting to me. I, uh, I like getting punched in the mouth. <laughs> I hope, well, that, that requires lots of patience. A hundred percent. A hundred percent, right. And I, I see a lot of entrepreneurs when they start, they think maybe within like three months to six months, they're going to they're gonna achieve lots of uh, money and goals and everything. It requires a little way longer than that, right? The patient itself. Yeah, and we're also, I want to remind everybody here, this has been an unbelievable of era of unbelievable amounts of money poured into the ecosystem. So for the last seven to eight years, almost nine years now, we've been on the rebound of global economic issues and, and obviously, if you're talking about mainland China, there was no rebound, it's just been growth. So one of the things that's fascinating to me is that a lot of the entrepreneurs that are navigating right now are navigating under the greatest time to build businesses maybe in the history of all time, if you look at the financial structure. So the lack of patience, the lack of actually having, you know, when I think about all the startups here, there mm -hmm. are few, few that are actually profitable. They're all burning, listen, let me, let, me give you, let me give you a fun little statement, Hong Kong, it doesn't take a fucking hero to lose money every month. 
<laughs> so True that. <laughs> anybody can do that. You're not special. <laughs> so I think that 98% of them won't make it to the other side. They'll never build something that sustains itself. There'll be economic slowdown. Everybody will wake up and realize they're far better off to take their money and put it in public markets than into this horse shit. And this great golden era will burn and everybody here will go work for at a bank. <laughs> and the ones that don't, when they hear me say that and they go, fuck you, Gary, if they can back it up and execute, they'll win. And that's the game. What's amazing, amazing about being part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem is it's meritocracy. Winners win and losing players lose. Mm-hmm. It's fun. I love that about this game. When I lose, I say that I deserve it. Mm. I think I deserve it. I made a mistake. I was wrong about the market. I was wrong about a person. I was wrong. I never think it was your fault or this fault or TechCrunch wrote the wrong thing or like, I lost. You own it, right? Of course. It's, I mean, the quickest way for me to judge somebody who I know is not gonna win long term is their ability to blame others. Hmm, interesting, that's very interesting. I'm pretty sure everybody here wants to ask lots of questions to Gary, but before, before we go there. And how are we doing that? Do you guys have runners? Yeah. Or are they lining up? They're lining runners. up. One more question though yeah, yeah. about Planet of the Apps. Yes. Oh, what's the background about that? I'm pretty sure everybody wants to know. Apple sent me an email and said, do you want to be on a show that we're going to put in 131 countries with Will I Am, Jessica Alba, and Gwyneth Paltrow? And I said, fuck yes. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Okay, anybody <laughs> wants to ask question to Gary? Hi, Gary. How are you? Hi. Um, I just want to say that um, uh, you don't have you don't get enough credit for being very present and 100% whenever you ask uh, answering questions to us and mad respect for that. So you're you're my fucking rock star. <laughs> <laughs> So um, my question is this, um, in business, anything can happen, right? Yes. So uh, God forbid, but if, if there's a major catastrophe that's happening to VaynerMedia, can you please tell us uh, probably three or five things that you do to readjust your clout and dirt and the strategic things that you would do? To Let me ask you a question because yeah. it, it will bring value here. There's three catastrophes in the way that I think about it. There's real life, which I would put into the category of health issues for me or the people I most love. There's outside internal forces that could be a catastrophe, which means business partners or investors. And then there's number three. I, can you let her hold the mic for a second? Can you give it back? Thank you. Uh, and then there's number three. There's internal. It was under your watch. Your or your employees moves caused the catastrophe. Which one are you asking? I mean, the things like uh, lawsuits, scandals, or you know, like uh, what Malaysia Airlines had, you know, like airplanes can fall, all kinds of things like that, which is, yes, you could probably prevent it, but, uh, or probably see it, or something like that, but things like this happen. You can't, you can't, you know, so to me, you know, for some of you that know that I write books, I wrote a book called Jab, 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 Right Hook. It was around content. But, I, but it was funny, I wrote that title for myself a little bit as an inside joke to myself. I've never said this out loud. D-Rock, you don't even know this. It's, you, and some of you have heard me say this, but this is why I titled it. I think being an entrepreneur and a CEO is a counterpuncher. I don't think it's strategy up front. You know, let's use football, and I mean not American football. Soccer as I call it, football. I think... Being a CEO is more about the coach that is losing three to zero at halftime and knows what to do to win four to three than being the coach that spends the whole week or two weeks getting ready to be winning three zero. So to answer your question, I'm mentally prepared for all catastrophes at all times, including the ones that I'm most scared of, which is the health and well-being of myself and my family. You have no choice. If your fucking plane disappears out of the air and lands somewhere, you have no choice. Mm -hmm. Like this thought that you're in control of anything is ludicrous. What you're in control of is your mental status to when that happens. So for me, I think I'm a firefighter. I literally sit in my little place and I'm waiting for it to go, like when I get off, 
here's the perfect one. When I get off stage right here, right now, right now, I'm captive right now. I'm paying attention for another 3251. I'll say hello to a little bit more, 10 more minutes. I will then walk back there and I will open my phone and I will have seven headaches. That takes a certain level of mentality that a lot of people don't have. It's a lot of fun at first when you have an idea and somehow miraculously your idea is worth $4 million and people give you a million dollars for you to go and do it. That's when you celebrate and you go out and everybody thinks you're a hero. It's the next day when shit starts getting ugly and I've got good news for you. How many people here are parents? Raise your hand. Perfect. It's the same shit. (laughs) The second that fucking kid is born, you're on the clock and you're worried for the rest of your life. And that's what a business is. It's, I never feel easy, Mm. ever. I don't feel easy right this second. I don't feel easy tomorrow. I don't feel easy for the rest of my life because it's all on my shoulders. And so how do I handle it? Easy, because I'm built for it. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. So basically we're talking about, you know, when you have fears, you just don't give a shit about it. Just go for it. it listen, everybody's, I'm, I'm petrified of my mother's health. Mm. Like petrified. So I have fear. I just think life's about alternatives. Life's like, I don't give a shit when people talk to me about theory. Mm. It's just binary. Like when, when your spouse gets terminally ill, theory doesn't matter. You have to navigate. When you lose your biggest client that represent, how many people here have businesses that have very large clients that represent big portions of their business? Raise your hand. How many people here have a client that represents more than 50% of their business? Raise your hand. I mean, that's fucking scary for these 11 people. Like, their businesses suck. (laughs) Like, they need to, like, one more time for the 11 of you, I wanna give you a piece of advice. You need to, like, tomorrow, like, you should leave this talk right now, leave, and start getting (laughs) other customers, because that's scary. Like, who wants to be, that vulnerable to something that they don't control. Mm. You know, so for me, mm. like there's, there's just things that you can't control. If the 11 of them lose that client tomorrow because the decision maker that is their client goes to a different company and the new one doesn't like them or, the, or has a sister that has a similar business, they're in panic mode. Mm. They've got to adjust. And so, you know, you know how many people here's businesses rely on somebody that is not them? It is scary how many people's businesses here that the most important person to the business is not them. That it's a salesperson, that it's a technical lead co-founder, it's somebody else. That is scary. And so there's a lot of things we don't control when we build our businesses. The market, don't even, listen, I'm a boy that's born in Soviet Russia. You start thinking about markets where you have to be nice with the families that run the country, fuck. (laughs) Right? There's a lot of things we don't talk about that make it scary, which is why I don't like the current state of entrepreneurship in the world because it seems very party and popular and cool and it is literally everything but. I started my daily vlog. Yes, I like attention and I want selfies, but much more because I want people to see how hard it really is how long every day is if you really want to be successful. And so I'm scared of everything, which actually ironically means I'm scared of nothing. Right, that is... Do you understand? Yeah, I got what you mean. Got it? I know it's a funny little statement, but by accepting fear of everything, it kind of makes me numb and makes me not fear of anything. Anything, yeah. That's awesome. More questions, guys. That was interesting. Yeah. I've never said that before. <laughs> Should write it on the quotes now. On your Insta story. It better be on my Instagram tomorrow. <laughs> hey. Hey, Gary. Big fan. Thank you. Uh, we run a home-based senior care company in mainland China. Home-based. Got it. So we, do, we train caregivers and they go to the home to provide Love services. It. Keep people at home where they want to be. Understood. Our challenge, our biggest struggle is selling the intangible and a still very tangible, focused uh, customer base especially in mainland China. 
So we're having a hard time helping the consumer to understand what, where there's value in an intangible business, where it's mostly the decision makers, the, the, the children, they're providing a, a service for their, for their parents that they're not really interacting with on a daily basis. Any advice that you would have? What are you trying to accomplish? Creating a wider net to more customer acquisition? Yeah, we're, uh, the, our biggest struggle is lead generation. So we're, uh, we're in other countries and, and have done quite well in other, other markets, and but what, China's what, much more challenging. What has worked us. there in those other markets? Uh, in the rest of the world, we sell quality care. So people understand that they there's want to a pay variable, for a certain value. Right, there, even though black and white, it looks the same, they understand the nuances that make you $8 versus somebody else that's four. Exactly. So, it, it, at, right, whereas in mainland China, that variable hasn't existed. Right, so we're selling time and freedom, convenience right. in China, not necessarily quality care. And why do you think that's happening? People in China hate their parents? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> No, I think there's some aspect of that that Do is... Do you think it's supply and demand of competitive landscape? I think partly there's, a, there's an informal caregiver that already lives in the home where you have that in Hong Kong and Singapore and China. So they already have a very low... Correct. Uh, That's exactly al right. Alternative. So, so one th uh, you know, look, I'd have to dig deeper to give you probably the best advice, but I'm going to give you something that will work for everybody and already I see enough nuances in your question that will make this valuable. The biggest mistake that companies make is they fight the market, right? So for me, I would argue to take a step back and remodel it to drive down the costs even more, not the other way around. I'd much rather spend all my time understanding the nuances and overhead of my business to drive the cost down instead of trying to culturally convince people that they need to pay the VIG of my brand versus the alternative. It is a fundamental important business practice that a lot of companies lose on, especially in the exact scenario that you have, which is when the model is working in other places. This is why people lose in new markets all the time, because they try to play the same blueprint, and what they think is it's a marketing nuance, I have often find that it's a product nuance. Excellent, thank you. You got it. Thank you. More questions? Hey Gary, Scott here. I'm a big fan. One thing, uh, you talk a lot about documenting yes. everything you do, like as a, as a great way to produce content. How do you keep it so fresh? Because you guys, I mean, you've got, the, you've got someone following you around, doing daily, v every, doing daily V every day. How do you make sure that you keep your content fresh? you keep your narrative new and keep your audience engaged? Well, I'm super fucking interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and maintain your ego at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I think, I think what's worked for me is that I understand things are tried and true. There are only certain ways we can communicate with each other. The written word, video, mm. audio. So what I've done, I think well, is created a framework. The vlog, DRock, where are you at? Let's hear it for DRock. It's a really important thing we did. By having the vlog, like the thing I just said about fear, mm. I'm fucking documenting everything I do. That's the first time I've ever said that. Now what happens back home is, it'll probably make the vlog. This, will, this whole day of eight hours, 12 hours, 15 hours of filming becomes, as you know, a 17 minute piece of something. Yeah. It's the other content that grooms from it, the vlog, is the framework, but all the quotes on Instagram, the articles on Medium, the podcast, will expand that Colin, for my team, in seven days, inevitably, is gonna ask me 13 questions over a phone call of what I meant about fearing everything and then fearing nothing. So the way I've kept it fresh is by documenting everything, we're stumbling into things on a daily basis that we've never said or never interacted before. That's why I love Q&A so much. It's forcing new shit out of me. And then I'm creating, so you literally read a Medium post in nine days because off a question just now, I randomly said that. Mm -hmm. So we've created, a. I am a human media company and the, and the pillar of my media, the anchor program is the vlog and all the ancillary supporting content programs come from the mothership. 
Got it? So for- I sell sawdust, right? Yeah. The byproduct is I'm cutting this wood, but the sawdust, one day, somebody in the world looked at all the sawdust, all the stuff that fell from cutting wood, and said, fuck, I'm gonna sell that. So for smaller businesses, you would suggest for them to actually create their content based on the conversations they're having with their customers? If they want to paint a narrative of a business personality environment. Okay. Right? You know, to me, it works hand in hand. You know, some businesses don't. But Wine Library would have worked that way. If I was documenting when I ran a wine store, when salespeople were coming in and tasting me on wine, that could have been the ancillary creative. So I think you have to make sure the creative matches the strategy of the business that you're running. I, at that time, wouldn't have wanted to be a business thought leader. I would have just wanted people to be obsessed with my wine tasting skills and selling skills. So the vlog or the quotes would have been more about me tasting a wine that I didn't even decide to buy for Wine Library, but I was giving you guys value by reviewing this champagne that you could have bought elsewhere. I would have brought you value that would have impacted me, got it? Sawdust. Still related to that question though, you are half man, half brand, half digital experiment, right? What's the tip for people who actually want, uh, entrepreneurs who wants to do business, but they are their own brand, like their own name is their own brand, not a company. Everybody's their own brand today. Now, there's a lot of people that are introverted. There's a lot of people that are overly humble. There's a lot of people that are private. You don't need to expand on your brand, but guys, we're just using the word personal brand for a word we used for a long time. It's called reputation, Mm. right? Like, I don't care what you call it to make it fancy. We have traded on reputation from the beginning of mankind. Oh, the person in the other town is a better butcher than the one that I have, I'll go there, right? Like, we've traded on reputation forever. The fact that we now live in an era where you can expand on that to the scale that we have never seen. My ability to build my personal brand, my reputation in Indonesia or Australia or Greece from the confines of my home in New York City with a very small spend on Facebook or with some KOLs in the marketplace is remarkable and unparalleled and all time iconic and grossly underpriced right now. You know, it's harder to become Baidu and Amazon today. It was a lot easier in 1999. This is a very special moment in time and most people are wasting it because they're debating if it's a good idea. Right, moving on. Sir, I think he really wants to ask a question. (laughs) <laughs> you were there before I saw you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Gary, this is Mircha, born in Romania, living in Toronto, Canada, in Hong Kong for the week. The first thing on your Twitter bio is... A little louder, please. Family man. Yeah, family first. How do you balance family and entre- entrepreneurship? Uh, by first making myself happy. Thank you. Wow, that's a, that's a very short but very important. And, and, he, and to his credit, he understood very, very quickly. I could see it even in his eyes, but I'll expand on it for everybody. Mm-hmm. If you are not happy, it will all break. Yeah. Just appeasing what is ever politically correct right now in work-life balance or your parents. The biggest thing I tell kids of why they should fight their parents is it's a lot better to fight your parents at 19, 20, or 21 than to hate them at 42. (laughs) It is, it's practical. This is not emotional. The amount of people that resent their parents to go becoming a lawyer and a doctor and blame them for the rest of their lives and then have no relationship with them for 45 years or underlyingly quietly on the low don't have a good relationship with them as enormously high. You're much better to battle it out in your 20s. You just are, it's smarter. Mm. It's the same way I think about work-life balance. Look, as you know, if you follow me at all, I don't show any part of my family, which makes it, and I work a lot, which then makes it seem like I spend no time with them. But every weekend, you won't see me in August at all, you won't feel it because I know how to create content like a media company, but I won't be around, right? And so 
you know, I'm, I have seven weeks vacation with my family. I'm with my family every weekend. It just doesn't feel like that because I figured out how to create and distribute at a scale that most human beings haven't figured out yet, right? But, but I always have to start with me. The greatest way to be selfless is to be selfish. That's really good. <laughs> It's, it's interesting, right? It's like, and it's becoming the theme of this conversation. If you look at me, I pull from very opposite directions, right? I'm fearless mm. in my overwhelming fear, mm. right? I'm selfless in my overwhelming selfish. need to be selfish. I adore your admiration so much. I read your Instagram post yesterday. You posted and you wrote six or seven sentences and I read every fucking word. I need it so much mainly because my mom coddled me and loved me so much that I'm trying to replace it, (laughs) that I'm such a good guy because I need the admiration. So my selflessness comes from that selfishness. You know, know, it, it just makes sense. The balance comes in the extreme opposite pulling, right? I really don't give a fuck what anybody in here thinks of me, zero. I massively care what every single person in here thinks of me. It's those pulling, it's in that strength. Macro patience, I'm the most patient. I'm, VaynerMedia is a company I'm building, I'm spent, guys, stick with me here. I'm spending 10 years of the best years of my life to build an agency that I have no interest in building I just want to build it as a framework for all my future behavior in my 50s and 60s and 70s. I'm giving up 10 years. I tell kids to have patience. They Mm -hmm. don't even have patience for three years to build the company they want to build and sell. I, after already making tens of millions of dollars and building a fucking bullshit agency business and have clients for 10 years to be a framework for all my future buying businesses and running them through the Vayner machine, right? Macro patience, but on a daily basis, I'm faster than all of you. Micro speed, 17 hours a day, programmed, 24 seven, right? Programmed, every second, programmed, fast, fast as fuck. I will absolutely, positively do more today than most people do in a week for their business, in one day, on a daily basis, but on a macro, It's a fucking 40 year platform. Pulling from opposite directions. Balance. Right. Awesome, don't forget to be happy guys. That's like the most important thing. More questions over there? Unhappy. And unhappy at the same time. So that, that's the balance, like, like you said. Right? Like, that's like, <laughs> like, you know, like, it's just so funny, right? Yes. Like, like, like if you know what you're doing, I, you know what it really comes down to? It comes down to hardcore self-awareness. Yes. Do you really know why you're doing it? Do mm. you actually know what you're trying to accomplish? Like, what itch are you trying to scratch? If it's money, I've got great news. That's the easiest part of the whole equation. You can figure that out. Get a job. Mm-hmm. Like put it in public markets and just wait 40 years. The money will be there if you mm-hmm. don't have to take it out. It will, as long as the, company, as long as the government you put the public market in is around. Like it's, it will be there. It just, people haven't figured themselves out. The stunning amount of people in this audience that are living their lives to appease somebody else, normally their mom or dad, yes. is heartbreaking. Yes, it's so true. And that's why I think most of people, it's really hard for them to find happiness even though there's a lot of things that they can be happy about. You can't be happy if you're not trying to make yourself happy. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, Gary. Question lady over there. Hi, Gary. Hi. I'm, I'm Ritu. I'm the editor of Entrepreneur in India and uh, was very glad to read your story last month in the magazine. Thank you. And given what you just said, um, you know, and I think you said a lot about sustainability and <coughs> building a business that lasts. Yes. And given the fact that we are in the era of disruption, do you think, do you think how, do you, how do you ask a, ba- a startup to balance between disruption and distribution? Because eventually I think a lot of startups give up when it comes to distributing and finding consumers for their product. Yeah, I mean, distribution uh, and disruption are in very different places, right? Disruption is a thesis 
of how you look at the opportunity for your business. You're either gonna disrupt yourself or somebody else is gonna disrupt you or you're starting from zero and you're about to disrupt somebody. There's only two groups. There's the incumbents and the newcomers, right? The newcomers wanna disrupt something that is an incumbent has and that's where their opportunity is. The biggest problem with incumbents is they're not willing to disrupt themselves 99 out of 100 times, which is why we have what we have. Distribution's a totally different thing. Distribution is oxygen. If you don't know how to distribute the awareness of what you're doing, nobody knows. The end. So to me, you know, disruption is a thesis. Distribution is a currency. And so, the best thing in the world is to actually from the product or service that you're providing to be disrupting, which alludes to bringing more value to the end consumer than what they're offered today, right? Which automatically puts you in a good situation. And then you have to be great at distribution to let you know that there's new things that are better than the things that you're doing now. Creating a better way to clean people's clothes is disrupting it. But if nobody here knows that to be true, through distribution, it's not gonna matter. Sure. So, so what's your advice? How do you, how do you sort of... Give a the- fuck about both. <laughs> 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 right? Like, like, the advice is be religious, blindly religious about being great at both. That's what I've done. Wine Library disrupted. Everybody was selling wine at their local store. I wanted to ship it to you through FedEx and UPS and DHL. And I did that in 1996 when everybody told me that the internet was a fad and nobody would ever buy wine on the internet. VaynerMedia is disruptive. While the biggest brands in the world want to spend all their money on print and radio and television and banner ads, I think that they should spend nothing on that and should spend it on KOLs, Facebook, Instagram, things of that nature. We're disruptive. Then I go and do shit like this for distribution so that happens. Sure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. More questions, guys. All the way there. Hi, Gary. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for talking to us yesterday and the guidance you gave us about using audio to, in, uh, for the future. I want to ask how we can use media to spread the news about inclusion, social inclusion. Like disabilities, like what you're like, working on. Yes, that's right. Content. Okay. The end. Like why, why when a government is going through a coup does the army take over the media first? Because the media dictates our beliefs. Like, you would be very sad to know how much of what you believe to be true is completely predicated by media either affecting your parents, grandparents, or you directly. Let me save you time, all of it. So, you need to tell stories about the value of inclusion. Now, very similar to what I said to that gentleman over there about mainland China, the biggest mistake that people that are doing good in the world make is they think other people give a shit. Mm. And it's a very difficult thing to say out loud. (laughs) But if you're gonna trade on feelings, you're barking up the wrong tree. So for example, if I joined your firm, the number one thing I would spend all my time on is proving that it is financially viable for inclusion. And then I would sell against money because that's how you get quicker decisions. Mm-hmm. Got it? Yes. Thank so you. if you made a video on Facebook and LinkedIn that targeted all the CFOs of every company that you wanted to do business with and it said, do you know that you can save 13% of your overhead costs with inclusion and then went through a one minute, 14 second video of why and it has to be true, you've got a fucking concept. Thank you. You're Thanks welcome. a lot. You're talking about feelings, right? That yes. means whenever, whenever we do our marketing or selling, whatever it is, you have to gain their trust to you and or, experience. Or, or their intention mm-hmm. for a, a moment. You've gotta get somebody to pay attention. Yeah. Then you've got to get them to feel something Mm -hmm. then they transact. The problem is most people try to sell on fear Mm, or negativity or shortcomings. I think a lot of the best things to do is to sell on positivity and optimism, but it's much harder because your product and service has to deliver. 
So for example, insurance. Everybody's got it. It's super not practical. The math doesn't work out. But we all buy it because we're scared. So there's a lot of big businesses that are built on it. Right. Um, I, just, I just find it more interesting to trade on optimism. But there's a lot of things to trade on. Entertainment, escapism. Guys, escapism is our biggest business. And all of entertainment, all of entertainment is based on escapism. Every sport in the world, I think we can all agree that Hollywood, Bollywood, sports, these are huge industries. Quadrillions of dollars, all based on the fact that we want to see people run around and kick a ball because for those three hours while we do that, we don't worry about how hard life is. <laughs> Escapism is an amazing thing to trade Escapism. on. Escapism. So I don't care what you do, you just have to do it on one of the things that get people to care. Most of the marketing here is selfish. You're making the content in your vested interest, mm -hmm. not the audience's. Mm -hmm. And that's why it doesn't work. It's so true. I think we still have time for one more question. Or two. Or two. <laughs> Hi, Stephen Koo from Manila. Hey, Stephen. Uh, you mentioned a while ago that the secret is happiness, and I, I totally agree with you. And I think uh, by finding your passion and what you do, you, you get happiness. My question is, how do you monetize your passion? By taking your passion and putting it into something that you can sell. Okay. <laughs> I know, but like sometimes, like for example, you, you enjoy nightlife or you enjoy... Great. Yeah. Start a club. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. Start a high-end vodka business that sells in nightlife. Okay. Start an app that lets people cut the line on the rope in nightlife. The problem is people love to talk about passion. That's great. You have to put it in a bucket that you can sell. So you have to synthesize what you love. I don't give a shit if you love fishing or football or drinking bourbon. Put it into a bucket that is a business. People go from here to here, it's the middle where you take your passion and make it consumable that you have to do. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's where a lot of people, Stephen, and as you can imagine, I wrote a book that was all about passion that I get bombarded. Great, it's your passion, but unless you put it into product form or service form, or you do such a great job talking about your passion that you have so much attention that you can get paid to speak or write books, you, you've got to put it into something. All right, this one question. Is, no, maybe one more. <laughs> Hi, Gary. Um, I have a question. What is your advice for young entrepreneurs in college that are trying to start businesses and run them themselves? Quit college. Quit college. <laughs> I'm, 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 prob I'm probably, if you're actually an entrepreneur, yeah. yes. Because I promise you, college is doing you zero for <laughs> entrepreneurship. You cannot teach entrepreneurship in a college environment because it is an unbelievable reality of like, you have to navigate it to know what to do. Are you collecting debt? No. Okay, good. Well then, <laughs> then, then you just have to decide, you know, look, what I would tell you to do is, pro you know what I would tell you, to do? if you were my brother, if you were AJ, I would say, you've gotta make a decision. Either you realize that these are the last couple years that you can really, really, really enjoy and not do shit and enjoy them, or, you could put all your energy into your business and let your grades go to shit and either get kicked out or let them push you through the system. If, if you know, you have to also understand, my definition of an entrepreneur is a little bit different than I think a lot of people's. My definition of an entrepreneur is you can't breathe other than when you're running your business. Thank you. You got it. You know, I was a terrible, terrible student because I couldn't breathe. I had to think about baseball cards. I had to think about comic books. And then I had, when I was selling those, when I was a teenager and a kid, then when I fell in love with wine, I was a sophomore and junior in my high school and I would sit in every class reading wine books. Like just reading them. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't breathe. There was nothing else. And maybe because of my love of that entrepreneurial way, Entrepreneurship now, it's just popular. 
And so it's different. And it will fail. It's too hard. Entrep- guys, entrepreneurship now looks like becoming a rapper and an athlete. <laughs> the difference is those are much more black and white if you're good enough. Everybody thinks they can be one. The problem is there's very few that can be successful and it's their life. Mm-hmm. And the collateral damage of going for it can be difficult emotionally. One thing we do not talk enough about and one of the biggest reasons I put stress on this conversation is there's a lot of underlining depression and mm-hmm. suicide in the entrepreneurial landscape. Yeah. And I don't want people to think they have to become entrepreneurs right now because it's cool only to then to fail miserably in front of everybody and not have the ability to swallow that loss. And that's why I talk about this, not because I'm cool and you're not, it's because it's a tough one because there's no hiding. When, you're fa- when your business goes out of business, there's no, you can't say it's you. And that's a tough scarlet letter. Right. Wow. Can we do one more? Is this, one, are my 150, yeah, I think we got 150 left, Yeah, right? we can have one Let's more. Let's sneak it in. Hello. Hello. It's me again, Evram. Um, I would like to thank you so much. First of all, I was, uh, I've been watching your talks, your videos a lot in the morning because my mom never supported me and I had to hear and watch somebody that will give me this push and thank I get you it. so much for that. I really appreciate it. I, I will tell you, and I apologize for cutting you off, I was so supported by my mom to be an entrepreneur and I want to remind people, and this is a great crowd to understand me, I was an immigrant. If you're an immigrant, or you come from immigrant parents, education is the way out. Every Russian, Jewish boy and girl that came from the Soviet Union with my parents was getting straight A's on their way to Harvard. I was getting straight F's. (laughs) So for my mom to have the self-esteem to not care what the other parents thought, to let me do my thing, it was such a gift that I now produce content on a daily basis because I feel guilty that I had it so good and I wanna provide that for you guys. That is why I do it. That's amazing. Go ahead. Thank you. But I just wanna make one thing clear. My mom loves me and... (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I bet she... (laughs) She would just hate me seeing seeing me failing. Of course. It was just her fear. Of course. But then I was invited to give a speech as the first Turkish person in China at TEDx. And then she started to share the video with everyone. Of course. And now she pushes me, you should do it. Are you working? (laughs) I'm like, mom. But um, there is one question that is eating my heart out. And I really wanna hear your opinion. So yesterday I got a comment from uh, one of the one of um, I'm so sorry. Yesterday I got a comment from one of the um, people attending to this conference about my um, speech my startup. Yeah, oh, your no, startup. my startup. So I'm the founder of Expat Neighbors. Yes. We talked before, but as I said, we started with expats, but it grew to returnees, local people, sea turtles that been abroad but came back. And then it grew to neighboring and local business, um, global businesses. But now the expat is a mindset. But the person told me to quit, stop using expat. But then it's just the journey. What do you think about it changing, starting with one name and then throughout the whole journey, the whole thing changes evolution, of course. Do you there's think two, that it's two good thing- to change the name of the company or? So there's two things that run through my mind. One, I think it, before we even get to that part, because that's the easy part. The first part is how much do you think about driving the business in the way that you think about it versus other people that you respect and what their opinions are is very important. Number two, it just depends on how good of a brand name you have. It seems that your business is small enough and young enough that it doesn't matter if you change your name now. But there was one thing. Um, So we got the partnership with Shangri-La and then um, the speech person in that hotel um, one time he said, so you're, a, you're an expert, what if you leave? I'm like, well, I'm not. And then another director in, in the hotel said that you can't, it's your identity. And I, I didn't say it, that person said it. So I'm like, whoa, 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 wow. 
yeah. that strong. But yes, we're still small in that case. Yeah, I mean, I'll be very honest with you. This is a non-issue one way or the other. Genuinely, genuinely, I believe that whatever you decide to do, it's going to be completely relevant to the outcome of the business. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I appreciate That's amazing. Okay, it's, okay, the time is up, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Gary V. I'm Cheryl Marella. Bye back there. See you on the next day.